Hey there, brilliant ACCA students. In this video, I'm going to help you get a pass on paper APM. We're going to dive into exam technique. I'm going to take you on a debrief of question Harry. We'll look at all the exam technique you need to get a pass. If you find the video useful, please give it a like. And if you have any questions, you can ask them in the comments below. All right, guys, let's get started. We've got question three open, and the expression performance pyramid is jumping off the page at me. So I can tell right away that this question is all about the difficult topic, the performance pyramid. Before you try this question on your own, let me help you get started. First thing to remember is time management. In the real exam, you will have a timer here on the upper right. And if you've been managing your time effectively, you should have about 45 minutes for this question. Let's open exhibit one and park it on the left. And let's have a quick read of the first paragraph. Let's just have a quick scan. And we learn about the Harry Keyboard Company. It's family owned. It's a business to business organization and they make keyboards. I can now close this for a second. Let's open up the word processor and let's park our response options, the word processor and the spreadsheet here on the right side of the screen. And before we do anything else, let's open up the requirements. Let's grab this requirement here. and let us paste it into our word processor. And like usual, the line breaks were not preserved. So at this point, let's reproduce those line breaks and see what we've got. So we've got one big question on the performance pyramid and from the notes, it looks like it's broken into two parts. We've got 13 marks for the first part of the work and seven marks for the second part of the work. So I will just make a note to myself with a Roman numeral one, a Roman numeral two. When I find those embedded requirements, I'll paste those right into this spot. And 13 marks for part one, seven marks for part two. So before I do anything else, let's think about the number of ideas that we need to generate to get passing technical marks. So 13 divided by two, six and a half. If we add a little bit more to that for some buffer, I'm going to go for eight or nine marks for part one and then part two, same thing, half of seven, three and a half. So if I can generate four, or five technical marks in the second part, I will be good to go. Let's look at the professional marks that are being examined here. And the professional marks will be earned as you craft your answer. They're not separate marks that you bolt on when you're all done. The first professional skill that we see is analysis and evaluation. All of your questions in APM will have this. When you get started writing, please ensure that you have a balanced approach, that you're highlighting good points and negative points. We're gonna find some data in this question. Make sure you use data from all areas of the exhibit. Don't just focus on financial information, for example. And make sure that your analysis is linked to this company, the situation that we find in this scenario. The next professional skill to demonstrate is skepticism. Make sure you take a challenging approach where appropriate. And if there are any contradictions or if any data is missing, make sure you highlight that. Lastly, we have commercial acumen. Make sure that every point you make is backed up by evidence from the scenario. 
If you're giving advice, make sure that it's practical and plausible. And any ideas that you develop should be applicable to this keyboard manufacturing company. Now that we've got our word processor set up and ready to go, it's time to read these exhibits more carefully. So what you will do, again, park the exhibits on the left here, and you can begin reading. When you get to exhibit two, you will find the important embedded requirements. You will find precisely what the CEO is asking you to do. Make sure that you read these two tasks very carefully and do exactly what the CEO is asking you to do. We're going for 13 marks in this first part, so let's give the marking team enough material to give you passing marks. We said that's about not eight or nine developed ideas. And for the second requirement, we're going for four or five developed ideas. Let's now look at the appendix. And here is the data that we will need in our calculations. We're given a performance report that is partially incomplete. We're missing some metrics for the bottom level of the performance pyramid. You'll need to review the available data, decide on several performance metrics for these areas of the performance pyramid, and then do your calculations in the spreadsheet. Please remember, you will also earn professional marks in the spreadsheet, so ensure everything you do is well labeled, is neat, is presentable, and formatted so the marking team can make sense of what you are doing. Imagine that the marking team were colleagues at work and you want to help them understand what your spreadsheet is all about. APM team. I've shared my tips with you on how to get started on this difficult question. It's over to you now. Please set a timer for 45 minutes. Give this question a good try, and then please view our next video, and I will take you through my answer and my approach to this question. I've got my word processor set up, ready to get started. I've read the exhibits and I've found the very detailed embedded requirements, the requests for work from the CEO. I'm going to copy this right into my word processor. And the second one as well. I've got the requirements, paste it into my answer, and I see now exactly what I need to do. Complete the analysis in Appendix 1. And the junior accountant has done some of the work, and we should only work on the operational performance indicators. What we will not do is go through every point in that report. What we will not do is a big academic description of the performance pyramid describing every piece of the model. We will do exactly what the CEO asks us to do. Let's now go into the appendix and let's grab as a starting place the three headings that are incomplete, waste, quality, and delivery. I can park these here. And as I've mentioned, when I'm all done, I can polish this up a bit more. So we've got waste, we've got quality, we've got delivery. I've reviewed the information that's been given to me, and I've thought about several metrics that I could calculate with this, with this information. I will do those calculations here in the spreadsheet. 
So I can park my spreadsheet here on the right and I can open up this appendix and I can get started with some calculations. And I'm looking for metrics that cover the three operational areas that are missing. And that was waste, a couple of spaces, quality, and delivery. The first area of performance that came to mind was utilization of the factory hours. We actually produced 1.05 million keyboards, but we have information about how much factory time we have. So how many keyboards should we have produced if it takes 2.2 minutes to make a keyboard? Well, let's do the math. Once we have the total hours, we can get the maximum capacity of keyboards that we could produce with those hours. Then we know the actual production. And with that information, we can get the utilization. Now we've got quality and delivery. There's no reason we can't move those a bit lower. I'm going to control X, control paste, put those lower. Under quality, we have information about their failure rate. So we'll be able to calculate that. We can also calculate quality costs. They give us some information there as well. Under delivery, we could calculate the on-time delivery rate. We have that information here as well, down here at the bottom of the appendix. APM team, I've thought of four metrics to get started with. Remember, I'm looking for nine or so marks, and I know from experience from reading examiner's reports that I'm usually getting one mark per metric that I calculate. So right here, hopefully I'm gonna scoop up four easy marks. And then in the word processor, if I can develop four or five ideas around these figures, I should have a comfortable pass. Let's make quick work of these calculations together. So the total hours, we can calculate that from note seven. We've got 16 production lines. Each production line runs nine hours a day, six days a week, times 52 weeks a year. And we've got 60 minutes in an hour. So now we're gonna get the total minutes. Let's do it in, let's do it in minutes, actually, hours. Minutes will be better because we're given the production time in minutes. Now, the maximum capacity would be equal to that total factory minutes divided by 2.2 minutes per unit. And my actual production is 1,050,000 keyboards. So we didn't reach maximum capacity. We can put one over the other and get the utilization of the factory hours, or the factory minutes in this case. Now the failure rate, we can go to note eight and make quick work of that. In note eight, we learn that the quality inspectors rejected 15,750 keyboards out of a total of 1,050,000 keyboards produced. So that's 1.5% failure rate. We have information about quality costs as well in note eight. We learn that 9,450 keyboards were reworked and that reworking costs 
$2 per unit. And the remainder were scrapped. And if we scrap the unit, then we write off the material that has been put into it. So we need to get the remainder, which would be the 15750 minus the 9450. And that's multiplied by the $8 per unit using brackets to preserve the order of operations. There we get our total quality costs. On time delivery, the last metric that we're going to calculate here, getting started. Well, we see that the deliveries made, now I'm in note 9, and we see that we made 4717 deliveries on time. out of a total of 5127 deliveries, so 92% on-time delivery rate. Coming back to the quality costs for a moment, let's be clear that these are actually internal failure costs, aren't they? There are four categories of quality costs, and here we're just looking at the defective units that we found before they went on to the customers. Last thing to do before we get back into the word processor is do a little formatting. So I'm going to grab these figures here, and we can put them to no decimal places with a thousandth separator. Double click on that column separator there to auto enlarge it. This is a percentage, so let's do a percent with one decimal place is nice. Let's do the same here. Let's do the same every time we have a relative metric, put it in percentage terms. And team, we have some nice looking workings and an appendix that will help us write up our answer. Give this, a, give this a nice title. We want to do everything that we can to make this professional and presentable. Here in the word processor, I can start by cleaning things up. I don't need this. I know what I'm after. I don't need this anymore. I've done the analysis in the spreadsheet. Now that I'm crafting my answer, we are talking about the performance pyramid. Let me demonstrate my technical knowledge, let me frame my evaluation in the context of this company, and let's use all available information from the exhibits in the development of our answer. So I'm going to start off with a quick discussion of the strategic position of this company because the performance pyramid is about creating a set of metrics that are aligned with the company vision. I'll develop two or three sentences around these around this idea of alignment with the vision. Harry has a clear vision cost leadership in keyboard manufacturing. That sentence by itself doesn't get a mark. That is just copying information from the scenario. But let me continue. This means that Harry earns their profit margins by controlling and reducing costs, which keeps them in line with their customers' strategy of reducing prices. Harry's operational metrics should be aligned with their cost leadership strategy. I'm setting the stage. I'm telling the reader of this document how I will be evaluating the metrics that I talk about below. Moving on to the three un unfinished headings of the performance pyramid, now I will plug in the metrics that I calculated in the appendix. So I calculated 
util utilization of factory hours, I calculated a failure rate. I calculated the internal failure costs. And I calculated the on-time delivery rate. My document is starting to look a little busy, so I will use a little light formatting just to make it easier for the marking team to follow my answer. This is called signposting as well. So I'm underlining my main headings here. Let me now bring in the figures that we calculated in the spreadsheet. I've got the numbers from my spreadsheet nicely placed in my document now. Next thing to do is to go under each heading from the performance pyramid. Those are the operational parts of the performance pyramid. Let me say why it's important that we measure each area. How is this, how is this linked to the overarching objective of the company? And then let's evaluate that metric in turn. So waste. Why should Harry measure waste? It's important for Harry to measure waste because this information will help increase efficiency and improve their cost per unit. I'm showing the link there to the cost leadership strategy that they use. Let's now interpret this metric, okay? 80% utilization of factory hours. We see that they are 14% short of their standard time per unit. And I'm showing the marketing team how I calculated this. This could be related to lost time reworking the defective units, for example, or a bottleneck at one of their machines. Harry can look further into this data and find opportunities for process improvement and cost reduction. Here I'm demonstrating business acumen. I'm linking my ideas to this story. I'm also showing analysis skills here, interpreting this number in the context of the scenario as well. Quality is important for Harry because producing poor quality keyboards will threaten their upcoming contract renewals. There are many manufacturers of computer accessories that would aggressively tender as well for these big contracts. Again, I'm trying to provide helpful advice to the CEO of the company, and all of my ideas are framed in the context of the Harry Keyboard Company. The, these ideas about the contract renewals came from Exhibit 1, so I'm trying to demonstrate business acumen as well, making sure my examples are linked to the scenario. Let's talk about these two metrics now. Failure rate, 1.5%. We see the internal failure rate is 1.5%, and customers also return 0.4% of the keyboards. So the total failure rate is 1.9%. 
Modern manufacturing companies often measure failure in defects per million. For example, when implementing Six Sigma, that's in your syllabus under the quality uh, heading. <clears throat> so this represents a potential area of improvement for Harry. Once again, I'm interpreting the number and bringing it to life with some analysis linked to this company. At this point, team, please pause the screen. Check out the remaining ideas that I've constructed here. You'll see that I'm using the same approach. Now, if I have more time, let me comment on the fourth operational area of performance under the, under the pyramid, and that is cycle time. Here we have the opportunity to demonstrate some professional skepticism. We can use the same approach. We could say why cycle time is important, but we can also comment that they are measuring cycle time with working capital metrics. And that's nice, but it's not about operational cycle time. A manufacturing company is going to be interested in the time to produce one unit. So let me write this idea up. Cycle time is a driver of productivity under the performance pyramid, so it's important for a cost-focused company to measure this. Again, demonstrating my technical knowledge in the context of Harry. However, they are using working capital and cash operating cycle as cycle time rather than operational manufacturing performance. It would be more helpful here to have manufacturing time per keyboard. Again, I'm demonstrating my technical knowledge about the performance pyramid. I'm showing that the operational levels are linked to the higher levels in the pyramid. And now I'm trying to demonstrate some skepticism with this next idea. I'm saying that there is a drawback in the metrics that have been chosen by the uh, junior accountant. Team, time is up for this requirement. Let's have a look. I've got four or five calculations, so that should earn me four or five marks out of the gate. And I've got a whole bunch of ideas here. I've got another six or seven ideas that I've developed in my writing. Let's imagine that the marking team likes most of it, but not all of it. So hopefully I'm getting another four or five marks for my technical ideas. So guys, I'm at about eight or nine marks. I've got a comfortable pass for this 13 mark requirement. I've also done my best to demonstrate the professional skills. Let's move on to the next part of this requirement. Here in the second task from the CEO, we are being asked to advise on the reliability of the non-financial indicators. Compare those to the financial indicators usually presented in the board reports. And we should focus on methods of measuring the indicators, methods, uh, sources of information, and methods of processing and checking, which is normally undertaken. So they're giving us a lot of great clues about how we can build up our answer. And we've been asked as well to use the operational indicators from the first part of our work to illustrate our advice. Let me give my answer some structure before I start. The first thing that I'll do is I'll talk about financial indicators. Then I'll make a heading, non-financial indicators. And I'll make subheadings then for the metrics that we discussed in the previous part of our answer. I've got seven marks, so I'm going for five or so ideas here.
we can then use heading subheading structure here to help the marking team navigate our answer. Let me get busy writing up my final ideas. The financial indicators that feature in board reports, like profit margins or earnings per share, are often produced with financial software and are more easily quantified than some non-financial info like keyboard quality. This information is also audited, so it may be more reliable. Hopefully I've earned a mark or two in this first paragraph. Let's now get on to our discussion of non-financial indicators. Quality. The quality metrics may be less reliable. If the inspections are done manually, some failed units may slip past quality control. However, automated controls, like weighing items, can be implemented which would increase reliability. I've made my point, and I've tried to frame that point in the context of a manufacturing company. I'm confident I'm earning a mark there. Moving on to delivery. The delivery metrics come from outside of the company, so there is a risk that a call may hide some missed deliveries to improve their on-time delivery score. Again, this can be reduced with automated systems, for example, with pallet barcode scanning at the pickup and the drop-off. And my last idea about cycle time, the time per unit may be more difficult to measure than traditional financial metrics, as information about production time will need to be measured and recorded at each stage of production, which is not as easy as recording sales in an invoicing system. However, this can also be automated with scanners and RFID systems to increase reliability. Here I'm adding a little icing on the cake with a nice example linked to manufacturing. Team, nice looking answer here. I hope in this debrief that you realized it's not about reproducing the textbook. It's not about memorizing the performance pyramid and then regurgitating that definition to the marketing team. You're using your techni technical knowledge and you are applying that knowledge to the specific task asked of you by the CEO and you are linking what you do to the story here. You're writing in a simple, in a practical style as if you were writing to a colleague at work. You're trying to be helpful you are trying to provide the CEO with valuable information. I hope you found this debrief useful. This is Steve saying goodbye. Good luck on your upcoming APM exam.